Well, I should explain a couple things. First of all, Okay, I think All we're right. online. Yeah, yeah, I can good. hear me yep. back there on yep. Patty's iPad. So, um, there was no moment with Scott today because Scott is and Patty are fairly COVID jumpy right now. That's how I would put it. So, we um, watched Arthur and participated in worship online, and then came in for class and kept the mask on and kind of keep into ourselves a little bit because there's just so much of it around and for our various reasons that you kind of know about. So um, I got a call about an hour ago saying, well, the power's out. So we drove down and the street light was out and we turned the corner and came in and wow, we actually had the slides up. And then Jack has been explaining to me the different pieces that can work. He did say that if I Encore got here to fix it, they would have to shut everything down while they fixed it. But maybe they haven't. So all I can say is if at some point in the next hour, we just go full on dark, baby, <laughs> we'll just make our way home early on this, on this Sunday. But I think since we have lights now, we're likely to keep them at this point. So that's really good news. It means a couple of things. First of all, it means the red boxes Three of them can move to the back of the room and you can actually see enough to um, register your presence. It also means the Joys, Joys and Concerns notebooks, all three of them can make their way toward the back of the room and you can write any Joys and Concerns in there that you have that you would like um, to have lifted up. It also means perhaps most importantly that the donut sign-up list can make its way around the room. So could somebody, Greg, you want to take that from me and just start it? Remember that? And that's got a cross around the room, sort of back and forth and everything. And I appreciate all of you that are here. I appreciate everybody that's online. Um, we're just in a period right now where a lot of people are online attending class. And, and my weekday classes are online, of course, Monday afternoon and Tuesday noon. And, even the Tuesday noon is going to stay online for a bit um, now. So anyway, let's see. I've got, what do I have in the way of announcements? Yes? Okay, Mike. No, but you have a big voice, my friend. Use it. Yep. Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> you can hear me now. We have a letter from uh, Chaplain Glenn Orris, Commander of the United States Navy, MA, MCAS Miramar Command Chaplain. Uh, I'm just going to read a part of it. Please be assured that your donation will indeed be a source of strength to countless Marines and sailors attached to Miramar Corps Air Station, I'm sorry, Marine Corps Air Station Miramar as they receive and share the timeless devotion or messages printed in those books. Especially moving is the fact that uh, most of these messages have now inspired generations of service members going back to the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor, which we commemorate today. And the letter is, a, is uh, dated uh, December the 7th. So it's just a nice thank you from the command chaplain at the station for the devotionals that uh, we sent out there. and. Again, thank you to the Missions Committee, thank you to the class for your continued support for this outreach of the United Methodist Man. We sincerely appreciate it. Also, the UMM Sweetheart Dinner and Movie is Friday, February the 11th. $45 a couple. The movie is The Proposal, starring Sandra Bullock and et al. And, wait, and Betty White. And Betty White. And Betty White. Uh, again, it's $45 a couple. Uh, it's going to be catered by Maggiano's, and you can go on the Realm and sign up and pay your uh, money if you'd like to do that. So, again, we encourage everybody to, uh, to come and join us. It will be in, um, it will be in here. Uh, that, uh, that's Friday night, uh, February the 11th. Thank you, and Mike. Like I said, if there's any questions, you can just go online and take a look. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, so another one, I, I, I brought this number last week. I just want to bring it back in case there are people who, who missed it because at the beginning it always takes us a few minutes to get settled. Y'all were fantastic in raising money up for Food for Kids again this year. The, we sent down just shy of $25,000, which was turned to just shy of $50,000 when it reached the North Texas Food Bank. And so... Um, in addition to what you raise for the storehouse, it's just it's just staggering. And the, spe- the ongoing collections that happen here every week when the baskets make their way around, and what you what you give um, on a regular basis into the missions account of the class, and the special collections all add up to uh, just a tremendous outpouring of generosity. And and um, I thank you for that, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful things that you are able to accomplish. So, thank you. S- the next thing is, I, I, the Israel f- trip for this fall is on, um, and as I said last week, we are, they are taking new registrations. There are, I don't know how many seats right now, it's, it's kind of a moving target, but there's probably at least a dozen seats open right now. So if you're interested, the thing to do is to probably email me directly and I will send you the basics, including the link to the web page that has all the information, all the details about it that you could read through and then make a decision and the, and the button that you would hit press to fill out a registration form and make a deposit. So, and I put my personal email address up there, not because I want, want lots of junk mail, from anybody, but because it works all the time, which isn't always true for how the church email reaches me, I guess. So anyway, right there, Scott Engel at iCloud.com. That'll work. I love you guys. You now have my my personal email. And um, <coughs> so just, just let me know that you're interested, and we'll take it from there. So, Miss Patty, what do you have to start us off with today? Well, first, I did just want to mention, since the movie is The Proposal, if you yes. haven't seen it, it's really a good movie, and Betty White steals the show. Yes. She really does. They're wondering how I know that Betty White is in that movie. But because you've had I'm to see it I'm kind of a rom-com me. guy. You are. <laughs> uh, I don't have much else What today. are the national days today, my darling? Okay, well, we have a kind of a mixed group here. And I did see this on the news this morning also. It is National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. Okay. It is Sunday Supper Day. And don't you remember when you... I don't know what that really means, but... Oh, my goodness. On Sundays, you didn't have, like, a big dinner on Sunday nights? No. Okay. I mean, we might have, while we're getting ready to watch Bonanza or something, I I don't know. Supper was more like for us on a Sunday in the middle of the afternoon, and then like we usually had something like sandwiches or something. When we watched Bonanza, but what came on before Bonanza? Disney. Walt Disney World, that's right. That's right. That was a weekly thing. And the third thing, and Scott and I know this really well, (laughs) in our house anyway, it is Static Electricity Day. We're constantly, like, shocking each other all Why the time. Why would you have a day honoring <laughs> static electricity? That makes no sense to me. But then again, there's not much in this world that doesn't make sense. But thank you for that, Patty. You're so welcome, Scott. You're awesome. Okay, let's open up with prayer. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. It's been a crazy morning, power in, power out, things on, things off. But we're here now. And we're settling and we're catching our breath and um, we are grateful to have the opportunity to go ahead (coughs) in the light with microphone, camera, and slides to have this class, to talk about John the Baptizer um, and, and all of this so that we can really come to understand better who your son Jesus is um, in our life as his disciples and so that we can become better readers of Scripture and where we come to meet the Jesus who is. So we're grateful for all that. Just be with us today. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are, as Arthur said in his sermon, we are, we are in the process of turning over, right, to the next section of this nine-week 
nine month nine month series. So let's just let's just get this will be a nice little grounding, get me kind of kind of going here. We are embarking on but really Christmas. Christmas really embarks on Act Four. But we've been to Christmas last week. We spent a lot of time talking about the incarnation. So let's just go back and review this, where we've been in this series. Act one in this series is the story of creation. When God creates everything that is, everything that is, if it exists, God created it. God created humans in his image, and he gave them a beautiful place to live and to work. He made them in his image. He told them to be fruitful and multiply. And when the curtain goes down on Act 1, it's all upbeat and the lights are shining and the trumpets are playing and it's all really cool and wonderful. But when Act 2 opens, there's a darkness that falls across the stage because the humans do the one thing, the one thing that God asked them not to do, to eat from this tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in that, they rebelled against God. And not only did they wreck their relationship with God, they wrecked their relationship with each other. And they are cast out of the Garden of Eden. And the consequences are immense. Are immense. Death enters the picture because in the garden, there's a tree of life that they're supposed to eat from, surely. But they can't now because they're cast out of the Garden of Eden. And the very first story that happens after they are cast out of the Garden of Eden is that, is that one son, Cain, kills his brother Abel, and that sets the stage for um, Act 3, in that there's the deep, deep abiding problem, and the problem is that the humans are estranged from God, and their rebellion affected all of God's creation. So Act 3 begins with the story of Abraham, which is the story of God's rescue project. You might think the story of Noah, which was the story of starting over in Act 2, but it ended poorly, right? They get off the boat, things start falling apart, they build this tower to the heavens. They're not going to do as God hopes they will do. They're not going to scatter across the earth. They're going to all stay right there. So God knocks the tower down, and that's all just... Not good. So when Act 3 opens up, and there you meet just one man and one woman, Abram and Sarai. Two people. Why those two people? I'm not God. Two people. <laughs> two people. And, God, and through them, God launches this rescue project to rescue all of humanity because he says to them, this is going to be a big project, right? I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you descendants more numerous to than the stars, and most importantly, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Act 3 is the story of Abraham's family all the way through. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the time in Egypt, the Exodus, the covenant that God makes with the family of Abraham at the foot of Mount Sinai, forward through the time of Joshua in the time of Judges in the time of the kings all that way and and it's a tragedy Act 3 is a tragic story because God has told them how to live he has said to them in Deuteronomy and Leviticus simply love me and love others Love love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength love your neighbor as yourself You probably know that when Jesus comes on into the picture later on and he's asked what's the great commandment, that's where he heads to those two statements in the Old Testament law, in the law of Moses. But the people can't do it. They won't do it. And so Act 3 is a story of tragedy. It looks like that's going to be the end of it. Act 3 is going to be the last act. Earth is going to stay in this big mess. Humanity is going to stay in this big mess until it becomes clear that God loves the world and loves humanity so much that he himself is going to take on human flesh in all of its frailty and do, listen to these words carefully, he's going to do and be for Israel and hence he will do and be for me 
for us what we are unable to do for ourselves, unwilling to do for ourselves. And that is the person of Jesus, God in the flesh, who will simply love God, love others every day in every way. And that's, that's what the Act 4 story is. And so it's not surprising if you've heard the past couple sermons, including Arthur's today um, or Lauren's last night, that this is a story, the story begins with the proclamation. Now what is that proclamation? The proclamation is that God is now doing what only God could do. That God is acting. God is taking action. Right? God is going to bring about the reconciliation of God and humanity. God is going to bring about the renewal of all creation. And that story is centered upon Jesus. So when Arthur said in his sermon that Jesus is the center of all things, he gets it exactly right. Everything, everything circles around Jesus, around God. Because as I explained last week, we talked about this last, right, last week, right? Jesus is fully God. He is fully human, but he is also fully God. And God shares one authority, one power, one purpose, one will. All right? So we find ourselves in Act 4 now, right at the beginning of Act 4, right at the beginning of Jesus' story. Um, and um, last week we ended up spending the whole time talking about the Incarnation, which I really enjoyed doing. I had some stuff for last week we didn't get to because I was having so much fun talking about the Incarnation. Okay? Whoa. All right. <laughs> That was just to make sure you're really awake and you're focused and you're grounded here. So understand that this proclamation about Jesus, well, let, let me go to Mark where Arthur was today for a while. The opening statement out of Jesus' own mouth in the Gospel of Mark is, the time is near. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. That short sentence. Those are the opening words, first words out of Jesus' mouth, right? And that news is the best possible news. Why is it the best possible news? Because God, <laughs> God is riding to the rescue. Pick whatever story you want to pick. I, I don't know why I always think about that movie with Tom Hanks on the desert, on the desert island with the volleyball. What was the name of his volleyball? Wilson, yes, Wilson, of course. It was, I, I was going to call him Spalding, but I, <laughs> I didn't think that was it. Yes, Wilson, the volleyball, right? So imagine a cruise ship pulled up and parked to that island to, to do what? To rescue Tom Hanks, right? That's how you have to see. We use lots of words, which we, which we use kind of in a churchy way, I think, that, that can get us off focus. What we're talking about is the rescue of humanity. Rescuing us from what? From what? Rescuing us from our rebellion against God. Rescuing us from our separation from God and all of the consequences of that. Why, why is there so much darkness in this world? Why do we get so many things wrong? Why is the world so often overcome by war and violence and hatred and division and pettiness and gossip and the rest of it because we are separated from God, because we have rebelled against God. So the rescue consists of reconciling us with God. Right? So that's the best possible news. It's like, it's even better than an announcement that, wow, there's a cure for cancer. Right? That's why we can't sit on this news. This is the best possible news there is. This is God's rescue of humanity. And Act 4, which begins that, the next phase of this rescue, because remember, it really began with Abraham. God did say to Abraham, all the families, all, 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 all of the families will be blessed through you. Act 4 begins, of course, with Jesus. 
his birth, the incarnation, right? And, and we have the whole Christmas season to talk about that, and we did. I want to fill in some of the gap between the birth of Jesus and his arrival on the scene as an adult in, with John the Baptist, okay? And so we're going to spend a, a, just a couple minutes, a few minutes, talking about three particular stories because that's all we have for the first 30 years of Jesus' life from the time he's born until he emerges a full-grown 30-year-old in their world, you know, in some ways middle-aged guy um, to begin his public ministry. We just have three stories. That's all. I know you want more. I know you want more. I know you want to know what, what kind of teenager was Jesus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> did he drive his mother crazy? You know, what did, it, what did he look like? See, we don't even know that. Why, why do you think we don't know why Jesus, what Jesus looked like? Because who cares? He's rescuing humanity. What difference does it make whether he's tall, short, fat, thin, whatever? I often tell people, if you want to, if you want to get close... In a reasonable way, just head to Israel and don't, look, don't, don't head for the Is- Israelis because there's a lot of European stuff in the Israelis. Go to the West Bank and start meeting Palestinians who have been there for thousands of years. And that's probably closer. But it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really matter. You know, he, he, I remember I grew up with what kind of Jesus? I grew up with the Norwegian Jesus. Right? You remember the painting? Imagine so many of us went to churches when we were little that had the same Jesus painting on the wall. He's very Norwegian. He's got the brown hair. He's got a little backlit behind his head and stuff, you know. He looked like most of us white folk. Well, you know, no, no. He would be, what would be the word? He was more swarthy than that, more than likely, okay? Being Semitic, living in that part of the world. So in any event... He's born. Now, the first story that comes from Luke is the story of Joseph and Mary being righteous, doing what the law of Moses required of young parents. And so they're going to bring Jesus. It's all kind of compressed. It's condensed into one little story because Jesus has to be circumcised. All Jewish males were circumcised on the eighth day, period, paragraph, end of story. It was, it was the overarching boundary marker of who was of the Jewish people. So Jesus was, of course, circumcised on the eighth day. But there were other things. Um, Jesus needed to be redeemed, right? Pledged to God in God's service and then basically redeemed back. With, with the payment of a few shekels. It just reflected the fact that you're born into God's service and then you're brought back into the life of growing up to be a carpenter and so forth with this ritual of redemption. And then Mary has to be purified after giving birth. And, and it's a kind of a lengthy process and they're going to offer up a couple of doves and sacrifice for all that. So that's, so that's what this is depicting. And when they get to the temple courtyards, as I've talked about many times because I love this story, they meet this old man Simeon and an old woman named Anna. And Simeon has been waiting and waiting and waiting because the Holy Spirit has said to Simeon, well, Simeon, you know what? You're not going to die until you see the salvation of Israel, which means and you see God doing God's big thing. That's my own informal, highly technical, <laughs> scholarly way of putting it. You can try that at seminary sometime if you want over there, Lauren, okay? God's going to do God's big thing that they had been waiting for forever. Well, okay. So Simeon's not going to die until he sees it with his own eyes. And Mary and Joseph and the baby walk across the temple courtyards. And Simeon sees them and he knows that he has seen the salvation of Israel in this child. That this child is the long-awaited deliverer of Israel. And not only Israel. You could look at Luke chapter 
too. And see, it's not only Israel, it's of the world. It's of the world. But then such a telling moment, he looks at Mary and he says, ah, a sword will pierce your own soul. And a shadow falls across of it. And sometimes we Christians want to run away from that shadow. We should not run away from that shadow. I've been reading a little bit by an Episcopalian scholar um, and professor and by the name of uh, Fleming Rutledge who, who says, look, um, Christmas is filled with all kinds of joy and the rest of it. We, we need to acknowledge that not every moment in the Christmas story is. Because you know what? Not every moment in our lives is. Not every place in the world is, right? So in the Christmas, sto in the Christmas story, which this is really part of, this is really part of, he says, how oh, a sword will pierce your own soul. And then even in the story of the wise men, right? So this was sort of last Sunday in the church calendar, but you know that they come from the east. They come bearing gifts. They've come searching for this king. You know that they've been, you know the story of how they get to Jerusalem and they end up wanting to find out where this is and Herod consults his advisors and they tell him Bethlehem and so the wise men head for Bethlehem and, and Herod wants them to come back and tell him where the child is. So they get there and they go to the house. The child is no longer an infant. No, really not. It doesn't really, the story doesn't work that well if you think of the child as an infant. The, the child has grown up. The child, they go to the house in the Greek, not a cave or something anymore. And there, the first thing they do is they fall to worship the child. Profound moment because those magi are Gentiles. Because this is not just a Jewish story. This is about the salvation of the world. Why? Because Abraham was told that all of the families of the earth would be blessed through you. All the families. European, African, Chinese, South Pacific, you name it. All the world would be blessed through you, Abraham. Now, the Magi are supposed to go back and tell Herod where the child is, but they don't. And so Herod orders the massacre of the infants. And this is a famous painting of the massacre um, of the infants, this very haunted look on the mother's face as she's trying to protect her child because Herod has ordered the murder of all male children under the age of two, which is sort of a clue that Jesus isn't an infant anymore, that Jesus, enough time has passed for, for Jesus to be older. So... Again, it introduces this acknowledgement that the Savior of the world is born into a dark world. So that's two of our stories. The first story post Jesus' birth is the story of Mary and Joseph and the baby all going into the temple. The second story is the arrival of the Magi and the massacre of the innocents. The third story is forward in time a decade or more. Jesus in the temple. And I brought a couple of paintings of this. This is, of course, this is the Home Alone story in, 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 in Luke's gospel, right? You know, that joke was a lot fresher the first time I used it. Right, Patty? Everybody out here knows my material. I need fresh material. Talk to my writers. Okay? <laughs> right? It's the Home Alone story. Of course it is. Because the, the family, you could do, here's a way to picture this. It's festival time, which, and lots and lots of folks from Galilee, they're all making their way down to Jerusalem, all in big crowds. What are the kids doing? They're all playing together, right? Are they all, all the children staying right by their own little parents in their own little carts? And Of course not. When I was a kid, we roamed everywhere in the neighborhood. My mom put this big bell in the garage, and she said, you can go anywhere you want as long as you can hear this bell. We pushed that envelope a few times, but yeah, I, I paid the price. But yeah, yeah, so they're all wandering down. All the kids are playing, and they go to Jerusalem, and they do their thing down there at festival. And then the whole crowd leaves. And they realize they don't have Jesus with them. And so Mary freaks out. 
naturally, and she and Joseph head back to find him. And they search high and low, and they find him in the temple where he has been amazing the rabbis and the teachers. And this is one painting that illustrates this boy. Um, he's pretty fair-faced, this boy, who is, who is just wowing them all, right? And, and it's, it's a story that begins to give you a clue, right? About, about how profound Jesus is. And he is, as we talked about last week, he's fully human. But he's profound. He's profound. And, and indeed, he is, he is God's son. And, and this story begins to introduce you to that in a way some of the others didn't. So I did find, you know, one of my favorite artists about, with biblical stories is the Frenchman who moved to England named James Dussault became a very strong Christian in his 50s and used his skills painting to create like 700 illustrations of the Bible. Now in Paris, where he was trained and worked his career, he was really into painting fashion. You know, drapery and long gowns and how the, the, the gowns would flow and all the folds and the shadows and all this kind of stuff. So he, yeah, that's my that's what I get out of it. Okay, so consequently, you see a lot of that in his biblical paintings. So this is, this is Jesus, you know, with his parents, and, and he's standing there. And what I noticed about this was, and I don't know why I brought you this, but just because I wanted to. Okay? <laughs> okay? So notice his hair. Jesus has some kind of hair, Right? Now, first of all, he's probably not a redhead or anything close to a redhead. His hair would be black, right? People from that part of the world, their hair's black. So, so I have a, a close-up, just in case you want to see it. There's the hair, and check this out. Now, I don't want to be disrespectful of James Dussault, but I thought this looked a little bit like the hair I saw in Farrah Fawcett in the 1980s. Yes, it does. It does. Patty's nodding. Yeah, yeah you agree with that. Wings. Right? Yep. Yeah. 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 You know, you know the picture I'm talking about. So those are the stories. That's all we have. Those three stories. At the temple, the magi, and then the uh, boy left behind. Until the opening of Jesus' public ministry. And that story begins with a person named John the Baptist. So... Before I get there, I'll ask, are there any online questions at this point, Patty? We do have one online question. It's not of what you just went through, but it's regarding Jesus. And okay, it's from Andy right. Ibsen. Um, Arthur was talking this morning, and we both heard this, when he was talking about how um, we classify Jews. Yes. Into different groups. And he wants to know, how would you classify Jesus as a Jew? Okay, so let me just provide a little bit of background like Arthur did. Today in Judaism, there are various what we would call denominations. Because there are the ultra-Orthodox. I'm going to do it like a, on a meter. The ultra-Orthodox, the Orthodox, the Conservative, the Reformed from most trying to adhere in every letter to the law of Moses as it would have been interpreted 2,000 years ago to those who will, are much freer in their understanding of what the law of Moses asks of them. So Arthur's point was that in Jesus' day, Judaism was very diverse, a wide variety of beliefs. You can't just talk about, well, what did the Jews say? What did the Jews say about Jesus? You, if you're really going to approach it well, you have to talk say about, well, like, who are we talking about? Or perhaps, so bold as to say, a majority of views which would tell you that there's still a lot of people that would disagree. So um, the key one to what Andy's talking about is like Joseph. When you meet Joseph in Matthew's Gospel, like, I don't know, maybe five times in those first two chapters, 
Joseph is called righteous. What righteous would mean is that Joseph was a man who lived according to the law of Moses. He kept the law. And that would be Jesus. Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to, to the temple to be circumcised, and Mary's going to be purified, and Jesus is going to be redeemed because they are righteous. They are keepers of the law of Moses. So that's, that's, who, that's who Jesus is. He's a keeper of the law of Moses. Now, yes, he, he helps people understand what the law of Moses really is. Like, yes, it's really okay to heal somebody on the day that you are able to heal them. You don't have to wait until it's not the Sabbath to heal them. But Jesus is a righteous man. He is a keeper of God's law. He says, look, I have not come to abandon God's law, but to fulfill it. Every jot and tittle I have come to fulfill because Jesus is a righteous Jew. So it doesn't really work to take the categories of today and impose them back on the first century. Um, indeed, the Judaism of, as I explained many times, the Judaism of your friends are built around um, synagogues, rabbis, all that. That is not the Judaism of Jesus' day. The Judaism of Jesus' day is built around the temple, animal sacrifice, the priests, it is only when that is destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans that a new Judaism has to emerge built around teaching, Torah, rabbis, synagogues, a Judaism that looks much more like the Judaism of the Pharisees because the priests are all gone. There's no need for priests if there's no temple. Okay, so... Let's go on, and I'll, I'll leave some time for questions a little bit later. Now, John the Baptizer. This is Elizabeth and Zechariah. The story of John's birth is told in the Gospel of Luke. He is Jesus. He's a cousin of Jesus. His parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, um, I come from pre priestly families, both of them. Zechariah is a priest, and he goes to the temple one day to perform his priestly duty. Maybe the only time in his life he's going to perform this particular duty. There's nothing distinguishing about the two of them. But the angel Gabriel comes to him and says, you are going to bear a child. Well, <laughs> he sort of scoffs at that a bit. Why does he do that? Because they're both really old. They're past childbearing years. This is going to be a story about a miracle God does, just as there were other stories like that in Scripture. And he indeed is rendered mute by God at this time. And he will not be able to speak until the child is born. And, um, but the child is born. And the, what the father says after the child is born is recorded for you in the Gospel of Luke. And so you know then that this child, who will be named John, um, he was going to be named something else, I can't remember right now, um, but he's going to be named John because God wants him named, to be named John. Zechariah does, says that's what God wants him to be named. He will be the one who will announce and proclaim the arrival of God's Messiah, the Savior of the world. Okay? Now... Really, just as with Jesus, we don't know hardly any, or we don't know anything about John's life between his birth and the time he emerges on the public scene, which is 30 years because Jesus and John are born about six months apart. Okay? Oh, Scott, stop doing that. Sorry, my apologies. So... There are a lot of depictions of John the Baptist that are out there and so forth. I, and I like going around Google and looking at images and finding paintings and things. So I found this altarpiece from a cathedral in France that has a depiction of John the Baptist on it. And this is the depiction. And I thought to myself, I don't know who did this, probably long in the past, but they kind of got it right. And Arthur talked about this. The dude looks like a prophet. Right? 
He looks like a prophet when he emerges out of the wilderness. He comes out of the wilderness. He's dressed in camel hair and skin. He eats locusts and honey and just, he looks like a wilderness kind of guy, right? Which is kind of how, kind of what the is what the Jews were waiting for. They even ask him, of course, sometimes, are you Elijah? Because there was, some of them were waiting for Elijah to return. So um, uh, John the Baptist is, is uh, going to emerge, come out to make this public announcement. So there we go. I, do we actually know what John the Baptist looked like? No more than we know what Jesus looked like. You understand that, right? No, don't know, don't know, don't know. So this is the community called Qumran, which is out by the Dead Sea. And there are many scholars who believe, and I'm really with them in this, that John probably spent a good bit of his life out at this community with the Essenes on the shore of the Dead Sea. Because just of the things that he said and the conduct of his ministry would seem, and where he does it, would all seem to indicate that he was with these group, this group called the Essenes, which were a very, they had moved out to the Dead Sea, convinced that God would work through them to bring about what? God's big thing. They would bring about the redemption of Israel. And so they move out to the Dead Sea, they're going to keep God's law and so forth, and they have a library in which they're copy, spending a lot of their time copying scrolls and writing some stuff of their own. And um, in 70 AD, when the Romans are arriving and the rebellion's underway, they decide they have to, have to hide it all. So they put their library inside of clay jars. They hide the library in caves around the area called Qumran, and those, when they are found in these clay jars, are found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the writings and copyings of the Essene community at Qumran. And, I, you know, it fits with me that John spent time in that community, maybe a lot of time in that community. But in any event... He emerges in about 30 A.D. calling people to the Jordan River. So I think I have a map up next to the Jordan River. Now, where on the Jordan? Probably here. We're told at one place in the Gospels that people were streaming there from Judea and Jerusalem, which would say to me it's probably on the southern end. There are also uh, Galileans there, of course, because if you read the accounts... There are people from Galilee. Some of those who will become Jesus' disciples are there in John's gospel. And um, it's a, and he's calling them out to the Jordan River. There's a big confusion for us that runs through all of this with John. And so I want to talk about that confusion for just a minute because it comes up a lot. I'm asked about it. It figures mightily into Acts 18. So John is calling people out to the river, the Jordan River. Why the Jordan? Because it is a symbol of freedom. It is the river. Let me back up. When the Israelites leave Mount Sinai after making a covenant with God, they make a beeline for Canaan. When they arrive, they chicken out. They're too afraid. They won't trust God. And God says, okay, I'll leave you to your own devices. So they have to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness until that generation dies off and the next generation will enter. And the way that they enter is not from the south. They enter from the east. And there's a story crossing the Jordan River in the book of Joshua that's very reminiscent of the Exodus because they carry the, the Ark of the Covenant out and they, they place it down in the river and the river dries up and they cross. And so sure, of course, it's a, just as the Exodus is a freedom moment, this is a freedom moment in the book of Joshua. They're going to go in and they're going to enter Canaan, the land that God has given them. And so it's big. It would always be remembered that way, of course. And so when John calls people out to the Jordan River, 
to be plunged, they would get that. Most would, I think. Now, here's, here's one little, you know, this is an enactment, I guess, of, of John out in the river. We call him John the Baptist. And here, here's what I grew up. Here's how I grew up. I grew up wishing, gosh, I wish he had been an Episcopalian. <laughs> why, why was he Baptist, for goodness sakes? I mean, why wasn't he John the Episcopalian or John the Presbyterian or John the Methodist or something? Why is he John the Baptist? You know, and I'm telling you, if I thought that, if it was in my head for way too many decades, I know it lingers in other people's heads. And the confusion, yeah, right. And the confusion is this. The word Baptist, baptizing, baptizer, all comes from the same Greek word, baptizo, which is brought in English. Baptizo becomes Baptist, baptizing, baptizer. And baptizo in the Greek means to plunge. I don't know exactly what you could be plunged into if the word always connoted water, but certainly water. So John is, <laughs> we could call him John the plunger, but, you know, that seems, <laughs> I don't think it would stick. I don't think it would stick. What do you think, Patty? You I think it would think stick? So. No, no, it wouldn't no. stick. So that's why I often call him, rather than John the Baptist, I call him John the Baptizer. Because I'm trying to help with the problem. Okay, so first of all, he's really John the Plunger. That's all it's about. He's, he, people are coming out and they are being plunged in the water. It still leaves us with the impression that what is happening at the river is what happens when we baptize children, babies, or adults today. Christian baptism. But it's not. You've got to draw a big, broad road between, big, broad wall between the two. John is calling them out to the river to be plunged as a cleansing as a cleansing for sin, as a cleansing so that they can emerge, cleanse from sin and sort of start over in their work to be God's people. But that's what it is. It's a cleansing. It's, it, if you want to connect it to something, you're better off connecting it to the story in Cana when Jesus changes the water into wine and there's those six big jars filled with water. Um, Water, okay, those jars of water in, in John 2 are ceremonial, they're for, they're for cleansing. Jewish homes were to have, who could, were to have what was called a mitvah in their house with water running through it that they would go in to cleanse themselves because cleansing rituals had a big, big place in the Jewish life. So that is what John is calling them out. It's like he's saying, look, people, we are losing our way. We have lost our way. Come out to the Jordan River. We are going to cleanse. We are going to plunge. We are going to, we are going to recommit. We are going to recommit ourselves. That's what's happening. And so they, they respond because they live in a very difficult time. Very difficult time. It's not a peaceful time. It's not pastoral. There aren't little lambs hopping around. Well, there are lambs, but maybe they hop. But we can, we have the wrong picture. This is a violent time. A violent time. Josephus tells us that a couple of thousand Jews were crucified on the roadways of Galilee by the Romans when Jesus was about 10 years old. There were riots at Passover. Twice Pontius Pilate was called back to Rome because he was being too tough, too violent, too many people dying, too much a risk that the whole thing would explode in riot and rebellion as it would in the second half of the 60s AD, but not yet. And so, of course, they come. And I do like this enactment because it shows some watchers of it, right? There would be people there. Some of them would be Pharisees, maybe from Jerusalem or priests or um, coming out there to see what's going on, you know, because the people are responding. The people, act, you know, people actually have power. 
Even dictators know that people have power when they can act together. I like the fact that they have the Romans there, right? The Romans are charged with keeping the peace. They're always trying to keep the, keep the, t the, the, the top on the tinderbox, trying to keep it closed, keep the peace, tamp down any trouble. And this, what John's calling them out for, to this river of freedom, to recommit themselves to God's way, not Caesar's way, to commit themselves to God's way, well, of course, it's filled with the opportunity for fireworks, rebellion, and trouble. So that's what John is doing. So let's talk about Christian baptism. <clears throat> As Jesus is returning to the Father at the end of Mark, Matthew's gospel, he tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all, 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 all nations, all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will arrive a few weeks hence on Pentecost. And the church would be born, this fellowship that you and I are part of. And baptism performs... Baptism is about our becoming part of this fellowship. Baptism is about regeneration. Baptism is all about the Holy Spirit. It's not foremost about a cleansing from sin. It is about rebirth. It is about what Jesus talks to Nicodemus about in John 3 when he says you must be born a second time. That's what Christian baptism is about. It is a baptism into a new life. It is a baptism into being new people. It is not merely a cleansing of sin or a moment of repentance. And that's what John was doing. So, so don't, don't confuse the two. In Acts 18, we meet um, uh, a Christian teacher and evangelist named Apollos who doesn't understand this. Under <laughs> Understandably, he doesn't understand this because it is confusing, right? I get that. And Priscilla and her husband Aquila have to pull him aside and help him to understand the difference between what John was doing in the river and what Jesus and then the church, the Christian communities are doing when they baptize people and bring them into the body of Christ and, and the spirit falls upon them, right? All of us who, who have come to Jesus... The Spirit dwells in us, and baptism is the crucial piece of this. It's, it doesn't, baptism is not a saving act. We are saved by our faith in Christ. But baptism, Christian baptism, is, is the word used in the Methodist paper on this is, is crucial. Crucial. So Christians have always baptized. We do it differently. We have disagreements about it, sadly, right? Infants, adults. Believer's baptism. But no Christian community that I'm aware of anywhere on the planet denies baptism. It's something that all Christians have done for 2,000 years across the entire planet. In the earliest church, just the earliest Christian communities that we know about, interestingly, Baptism would come at the end of a two or three year period of learning. So you would show up and you say, hey, man, I want to be part of this. And then you would be part of it. And you would do the things and you would learn and you would work and you would serve and you would live your life and you would work and you would serve and you would learn. And after two or three years of, of learning, you would be baptized. So we may do it differently, Okay. We handle the water differently. Some people actually plunge. Some of us do it with just sprinkles. Arthur does it with entire handfuls poured on unsuspecting, <laughs> unsuspecting women. But <laughs> one trip to Israel, this would be the 2016 trip that Arthur and Becky were on, right? Mm -hmm. We had four people from the church who were baptized. Um, they didn't think they had ever been baptized before. So, so Arthur baptized them in the river. Perhaps they had been. I don't, I don't know. It doesn't really matter, does it? So he baptized um, right in the Jordan River. They went in, and they all came out wet, let me tell you. 
So, all right. So let me just pause for a second and see if there's any questions about that. Yes, Kathy? Then why would Jesus need to be plunged? Okay, so <laughs> let me hold that till the next slide. See if I have anything, any other question. Mike? Well, we're told in the Gospels that their, you know, in, in, that their home, their home was in Nazareth. His ancestral home is Bethlehem, but their, the home that they had with family and stuff was in Nazareth. So I think that's, that's why. They would stay there for their entire lives. Joseph would have died there. It's their home. People didn't move, really. They kind of grew up and stayed in their, 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 their little village. Most people never went very far from the village. The, the biggest movement that Jews of that time in Judea or Galilee would make would be coming to Jerusalem for festival. That's what would even get them out of their villages. Now, short of that, they probably would never go more than, you know, 20 miles from their, from their village. Okay, so let's, let's talk about Jesus' baptism. Why does Jesus come to the river? It's a really good question, isn't it? And, and does Jesus need to be cleansed of sin? No, because he is the sinless one. He is the one who actually loves God and loves others every day and in every way. So why would he come to John? First of all, he comes to John because it is the announcement of his arrival. Right? This is where I love John's gospel. John the gospel writer, not John the Baptist. He didn't write a gospel. John the gospel writer, um, the youngest of the disciples. When in chapter 1 of John's gospel, John the baptizer sees Jesus coming down the river bank, and he, here's how I see it. He sees him coming, and there's some people right there, people whose names you know, who are right there around in the here. And John says, behold, I love that old word, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. What a profound moment. So in the midst of this freedom party, this, this recommitment to God on the part of the Jews, Jesus arrives their deliverer, their Messiah, the one who is the one who is the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Now, Jesus is also a righteous Jew. And one thing that righteous Jews did was to participate in various cleansing ceremonies. How would it have been if Jesus had not? Growing, he's 30 years old when he starts this. What if he spent the first 30 years of his life saying, nah, 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 that stuff's not for me? How would he be seen? Would he be seen as a righteous Jew? The answer to that is a straightforward no. No. So I, 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 I don't like to get too deeply theological about this. Like, what's Jesus doing there? Because he doesn't have sin. Why does he get out of that river real fast before he gets, you know, no. So the third thing that happens, of course, is that there is this announcement from the heavens about who Jesus is. And the Gospels are a little bit ambiguous, actually, about who actually hears all of this. Sometimes it just seems like only Jesus hears it. Sometimes it seems like other people hear it. But a voice from heaven calls out, this is my son with whom I am well pleased or something the equivalent of that, right? So there's this big moment where Jesus arrives. John certainly gets who he is. And John goes on to say, this is the one I'm telling you about. It's not about me. This is the one I'm here. I'm baptizing with water. He's going to baptize with the Spirit. Connecting to the two differences between the, what John is doing and Christian baptism. He says, I'm not worthy to untie his thongs. It's about him. It's not about me. It's about him. It's not about me. John says. And now Jesus comes and he's in the river and 
the spirit descends and the voice from heaven pronounces, yes, you are my son who is well pleased. Now, do people see in all of this many different layers? <laughs> yes. I don't think it's like so many parts of the gospels. They're, they're, they're not, they're not one layered. There's not like one meaning you should get from each piece of it. I, there, I run into Christian scholars who would try to maintain that. And I, I think to myself, shoot, that's not true even for most of the things I encountered in my everyday life. There's often multiple meanings in what Patty tells me. <laughs> and I'm supposed to get them all. <laughs> right? So, 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 yeah. But... It's, for me, maybe more, you know, I, I don't know what um, Lauren's professors would have to say about this, but I think the focus on Jesus is being righteous. Um, this is the beginning of his ministry. Um, John proclaims him, and uh, the heavens, God proclaims him. God announces him. And so Jesus is, is what? So now... So now Jesus is ready. So now Jesus is ready to commence, um, to commence his, his ministry. And he does. And so we'll see, you know, when we come together next week, and I see I'm running up against time, that he's going to begin calling his disciples. But it's, it's, it's a pretty shortened story for John because in closing, you know what happens to John. His head ends up on a platter. Because this little Herodias dancing Salome, she, they want his head. And so John's, John's head is offered up on a platter. And it's a very emotional moment for, for Jesus in the Gospels. So that's, uh, that's, that's John the baptizer. And when we come together next week, we will talk about the calling of the disciples the stories of the disciples being called by Jesus. So if, and if we could get the joys and concerns, notebooks, sheets. And Scott, can you um, please just for a minute go back over the name tag stuff? Oh, yes, I forgot the name tag stuff. Okay, so we've been asked about name tags. If you look, the name tags are all over here. There they are, and the lights are on. So Tom and Mary Ann have gone through and straightened them all out, which let me tell you, is a Herculean effort, okay? It's such a Herculean effort that we're going to manage the name tags differently. You're going to go over and pick your name tag up, and you're going to be the keeper of your name tag. <gasps> yes. You can keep it in your car. You can keep it in your house. You can keep it wherever you want. So go ahead, take your name tag, take it away, Keep track of it. Bring it back next week. Slip it on as you come into class. I think it'll work better than the massive congestion we had around the name tag boards before. I don't think they were very much used. And if you do not have a name tag, indicate that next week on the red boxes when they come around or um, email me and I'll forward it on to Connie. Yes. Wow. Gosh, you guys are always a step ahead. There's a clipboard there that you can put your name on if you need a name tag. But I think there'll be name tags there for many of us. And so that's what we're going to do. Is there any questions about the name tag stuff? We're going to take them home and be very good at remembering to bring them back. Now, Miss Patty. Okay. I got the joys and concerns. And... I thought some other people might think this was interesting because years ago, the very first time I heard Scott use the phrase jot and tittle, whoa, I had never heard it before. And I thought, wow, that's really biblical, Scott. Well, come to find out it is. The <laughs> origin of that phrase is actually from Matthew. And the way we normally say it, like in the um, NIV, I'll tell you what 518 is. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In the New King James Version, they swap that out with jot and tittle. Right, because and in the is, Hebrew it's jot and tittle. Yes. Which are, here's what they are. Here's what the, the a, a jot and a tittle were actually the smallest punctuation marks 
not really punctuation, the smallest markings used on the Hebrew scrolls. Huh, yep. Dot and diddle. Sounds funny. Anyway, whenever you say it, it still sounds funny to me. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I don't use it. In I'm so mature. Casual company. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So please join me in prayer. I have a number of prayers that came over today um, on Facebook. We had a huge crowd, well over 90 people on Facebook today wow. watching this class with us. So that was great. I'm so glad they were able to get the electricity back and that everything worked. I had a number of requests for prayers for Hull Kenny, who's a member of our class, and he is recovering from very serious surgery he had this week. So let's pray for him and his wife, Nancy, as he continues to get news from doctors and what the rest of his treatment and everything is going to look like. We have prayers for Barry and Judy Dodson. Um, they both are still at home with COVID. They say they feel well, but they're still home and you know, taking care of themselves and not coming back to church yet. Um, we're praying for Norm Zen's sister-in-law. Her name is Jean. She has terminal brain cancer, and she is currently being cared for at home by her daughters. Prayer for John Hamm, who's a member of our class and also a friend of Carol's in our class, is scheduled for hip replacement on Wednesday. Prayers for the family of Scott Pegram. Um, he's a young man who lost his life this past week. He's 34 years old, and he left behind a wife and two very small children. Uh, joy for this class is confirmation class, this church's confirmation class, which actually started today. And this is from Kathleen and Russell Harden. Prayers for Cousin Gary had pancreatic cancer surgery on Thursday, and we are praying that they got all of the cancer and for healing for him. If you would join me as we close. Heavenly Father, today we lift up all these prayers to you. Most of our prayers today, Lord, were prayers of concern, of healing. Um, Lord, this world is so broken in so many ways, and we need your healing, Lord. We need to feel your presence. We want to feel your presence, God, and, and help us, God, when we don't that it is us who have moved away from you, that you are our steady rock. You are always there. It is us who have moved from you. Lord, we pray right now for all those that are still suffering from COVID. It has just turned into such a gigantic, enormous pandemic of proportions we could have never seen even a few months ago. We pray, God, that you would help this Help the people, Lord, of, of your world right now, Lord, getting through this pandemic, through the illness, through some death. We pray, God, for healing. We pray for this pandemic to be over soon. We also just pray, God, for our government today. We just seem to be divided in so many ways, and we pray, God, for your peace, your peace that passes all understanding, God, to get us out of some of the situations we're in now. We pray, God, for every person in this room. We pray for their friends and their families. We pray, God, that you'd help keep them healthy and safe. And we pray, God, for each one of us, your wisdom and your discernment in our lives to help us make good decisions every day. We love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being such a faithful God. All this we pray in the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And okay, well, thank you all very much. I'm glad we ended up with lights and power. Adios. We will see you next week. <laughs>